Right. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Sherry Shia, as Alex uh, very nicely introduced. I'm a bioinformatician in the Mayan lab at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Um, you might remember me. I did the very first lecture on Python, um, but today I'm going to be introducing the concept of enrichment and pathway analysis. So there's going to be three main sections to this lecture. Uh, which will go over the concept of enrichment analysis, as well as two popular methods for computing enrichment analysis, and that is the GSEA algorithm and then the Fisher's exact test. So I believe that enrichment analysis may have already been mentioned briefly in previous lectures, um, but the goal today is to give some more background on what it is and why we use it. So in general, um, we know that there's lots of omics profiling data that's being published every year, and often these are focused on specific physiological or pathophysiological conditions. And then so the question is, using that data that's being produced, how do we identify common functions for genes and proteins or explain the molecular mechanisms underlying any given cellular or organismal phenotype? And this is going to be the driving question for a lot of omics profiling studies. And so one way to kind of answer those questions or start, um, start to answer them is through the process of gene set enrichment analysis. So in general, omics studies will focus on some process, disease, compound, or condition, as I mentioned. Um, and then through some type of molecular profiling, you can generate a signature, which can then be turned into a ranked or unranked gene set. Uh, when I say molecular profiling, um, some of the more common types are genetic protein expression profiling studies. So this is RNA sequencing or a microarray, for instance, and these generally produce some type of gene signature. There are also GWAS studies, um, which produce sets of genes that are associated with a trait. There's ChIP-seq studies, which identify target genes of transcription factors, and then many other types of omics assays, which also generally will produce some sort of up and down gene or protein list. So then what you can create from all those um, omics profiling studies and signatures are gene sets. Um, which are generally conceptualized as kind of a bag of genes um, or just an unordered collection of genes with some shared association or function. In this example, uh, we let's say we're studying this process of glucose metabolism. Uh, we run our profiling assay. We generate this signature with the highly and lowly expressed genes from that um, study. And then we can create a gene set that includes the most highly and most lowly expressed genes from that signature. We could also create two separate gene sets for the highly and lowly expressed genes separately. A gene set library then is generally a collection of multiple related gene sets, um, such as those from a single resource, or gene sets are generated from a single data set or corresponding to related biological terms. One well-known resource for gene set libraries is the gene ontology. Um, and here on this page, I have some examples of gene ontology terms related to carbohydrate metabolism. So if we, we can see that we have our gene set corresponding to glucose metabolism in blue in the bottom left, but we can also see how it might relate or overlap with some of its parent gene sets, which are hexose metabolism and monosaccharide metabolism, as well as other related gene sets like tetrose metabolism and pentose metabolism. Um, this graph isn't an exact representation of what these gene sets consist of, um, but this is just to give an idea of how gene set libraries actually um, might look like uh, in the context of many different gene sets. One other concept that's important to keep in mind is the background, which is the context for the analysis, or basically which genes should actually be considered when you're doing gene set enrichment analysis. Um, and in general, uh, you can and should use the genes that were measured in whatever assay that was used to generate um, your input data. Um, one common mistake is that if, for instance, if you're studying just um, gene expression patterns in brain cancer, some researchers might be tempted to look specifically at genes that are expressed in brain tissue in order to understand how those genes change in brain cancer. 
Um, but there are cases where in certain diseases, if you only look at the tissue specific genes as the background, you're going to miss certain genes that might be aberrantly expressed in the brain tumor that aren't actually expressed in normal brain tissue, and that you're not considering that in your analysis. On the flip side, um, note that just using all the genes that are studied by the assay you use might also not be enough sometimes. Um, for instance, there is a data set called the L1000 data set, which consists of 978 genes that are measured and then 11,000 genes that are inferred uh, from the expression of those 978 genes. You'll notice that that only adds up to around 12,000 genes, um, which is not quite the full genome. So even when you are using all the genes, looking at all the genes that your assay study, you might still be missing some genes. Um, so in general, this is uh, tricky, but you should just use as many genes as you can. So now that we've defined some of the key terms and concepts in enrichment analysis, we can start talking about how you would actually perform enrichment analysis. And most methods and algorithms will follow these steps generally. Um, so first, as we mentioned before, you want to actually obtain some set of genes or ranked list of genes from a profiling omics study. So for instance, maybe you're interested in the role of a specific gene. So you obtain samples where that gene is knocked out and samples where that gene isn't knocked out. You perform some profiling assay, and then you're able to obtain a signature um, for the knockout of that specific gene. Then you want to compare that gene set that you've just obtained from your own study against a gene set library usually. Um, and as I mentioned before, this is just a set of those gene sets that are all functionally related based on prior knowledge. And so for instance, for your knockout gene, if you suspect that it might play a role in a certain pathway or a certain type of pathway, you can compare your input gene set to the gene sets in that gene set library. And then finally, your algorithm will usually then identify the terms that correspond to gene sets where genes from your input set are overrepresented. And there, this will generally be some kind of ranking of the gene terms where the most overrepresented gene sets will be ranked at the top. Um, and I do want to take a moment to kind of differentiate between overrepresentation and overlap. Um, some types of enrichment analysis, you'll actually see them referred to as overrepresentation analyses. Um, and this is because there is a difference. So for an input gene set and a comparison gene set, if you're considering just overlap, you're mainly looking at the exact number of unique shared genes between those two gene sets, um, which sounds like a reasonable method. However, this does lead to a bias towards longer gene sets. So let's say that you have your input gene set, there's 20 genes in it, and you're comparing it to two different gene sets, one for pathway A and one for pathway B. If you're looking at pure overlap, it looks like based on your result that pathway B is more represented um, if the input genes or the input genes are more represented for pathway B. But if you consider that pathway B is significantly larger, um, and possibly the input genes do play a role in pathway B, but you're also going to miss out on the results for pathway A just because the overlap is a little lower. So you want some way to kind of account for the fact that gene sets are of different lengths and you don't want to discount results for shorter gene sets. So that leads us to this idea of overrepresentation which generally looks at whether genes from the set that you're comparing to are present more than you would expect by random chance within your input gene set. Um, because you're looking at something more than randomly expected, this usually requires statistical testing. And in most cases, the null hypothesis is that the genes from the comparison gene set are not more differentially expressed in your input data than would be expected just by random chance. In general, there are many different tools and algorithms for performing uh, gene set enrichment analysis. So some of the ones I've listed here um, include David Webb Gestalt, um, Panther, which I believe uh, works with gene ontology. There's also the original GSCA algorithm, um, which is the paper right in the center. 
there's Enricher, um, which our lab developed, and then there's also just many, many other methods um, that are listed and also not listed that you can look into. And then, as I said before, the gene set enrichment analysis algorithm and Enricher, uh, which uses the Fisher exact test, will be discussed further later on in this lecture. Um, but kind of going back to the original why of enrichment analysis. So once you have your enrichment analysis of results, which is those term rankings, you can start to understand the biological themes that might be underlying the gene set or ranked gene list that you obtain from your data. So for example, which known pathways are involved um, in the data that you're looking at? So what biological processes are appearing to be disrupted? Um, what cell or tissue types are being represented in this data? What gene and protein expression regulators are implicated? Um, and this gives you a pretty good starting point for diving deeper into whatever uh, condition or disease or drug or gene you're specifically looking at in that original omic study. Um, so to kind of wrap up this section of the lecture, um, we talked about how arrangement analysis can help identify common biological functions for a given list of genes or other molecules obtained from an omic study. Um, I know in this lecture, I mostly discuss gene sets and gene lists, um, but generally the same process can actually be used to analyze proteins, metabolites, drugs, and other small molecules. You can also, um, excuse me, so also examining sets of or ranked lists of sets can also lead to more mean, meaningful and robust results in examining individual genes. Um, and many different tools and algorithms, which I shared in the previous slides, already exist for performing this type of analysis. Um, so this is just, um, I believe you all have a copy of the slides, but these are just some of the most well-known resources I could find. Obviously, there's also many others if you look online. <laughs> 